In this video, I will be performing the Polonaise number no. 8 in E minor by Wilhelm Friedemann Bach because I think it helps to be familiar with the piece before discussing it. This video will be structured as follows. First, there will be a video performance of the piece. Then I will discuss the piece, placing it within the context of its time and also examining it in terms of structure and interpretation. Finally, I will perform the piece once more. This time the performance will be accompanied by the score. I should mention that the two performances are different because I use different equipment for video and audio recordings, although both were recorded on the same evening. Let's start with the video performance.
While the situation is gradually improving, the modern narrative of music history has generally not been particularly kind to the period between the Baroque and the Classical era. The common designation pre-classical in many ways reflects the negative value judgment associated with the composers of that time, who are usually regarded as transitional figures that, on the one hand, moved away from the style of great Baroque composers such as Johann Sebastian Bach and Handel, and, on the other hand, had not yet reached the level of compositional excellence evident in the works of Haydn and Mozart. Hence, these composers are pre-classical in the sense that their musical language had not yet developed enough to reach the maturity of the classical style. Indeed, in his book, The Classical Style, Charles Rosen claims that pre-classical composers were unable to explore the full potential of their musical material. Quote, From the death of Handel to 1775, no composer had sufficient command over all the elements of music for his personal style to bear the weight of a large series of works, a genuine oeuvre. We disapprove nowadays of the idea of progress in the arts, but the deficiency of technique of even the finest talents of the period is a hard fact." End quote. In my opinion, this is a very simplistic view for at least a couple of reasons. To begin with, it overlooks the fascinating development and sometimes coexistence of distinct styles that are aesthetically very different from each other. Thus, the galant style tends to be lighthearted, emphasizes homophonic textures, and usually follows recognizable musical forms. By contrast, the Empfindsimerstil, usually referred to in English as the sensitive style, prioritizes expression over form and can contain all sorts of surprising twists, as it does not usually adhere to one particular mood. Furthermore, it can also combine different genres and formal patterns. The second reason I find this dismissive view problematic is that it overlooks the unique musical contributions of many of these so-called transitional composers, as well as the significant influence they exerted to later generations of composers. It is revealing, for instance, that when Mozart said of Bach that he is the father, we are the children, he was actually referring to Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach and not Johann Sebastian. So maybe, just maybe, Mozart understood something that those who dismiss pre-classical composers simply fail to grasp. Like many of his contemporaries, Wilhelm Friedemann Bach has not received the attention he deserves. In his case, however, the reasons he has been neglected arguably extend beyond the fact that he belongs to the pre-classical era. To begin with, he is almost always unfavorably compared to his father. The fact that Johann Sebastian Bach has come to be considered one of the greatest composers means that Wilhelm Friedemann's music is rarely appreciated for its unique features. In addition, Wilhelm Friedemann apparently had a hard time getting accepted, even during his lifetime. At a time of changing musical tastes, he seems to have stuck to his highly personal musical style that combined Baroque gestures and contrapuntal techniques, and sometimes even predominantly Baroque genres such as the fugue, with an expressive language that gravitated towards the Empfindsamerstil. 
in many respects, the Empfindzimmer Stil is based on a radically different aesthetic compared to other pre-classical trends, as well as the classical style that would dominate by the end of the 18th century. What made it so different was its emphasis on expression. In a society that was increasingly turning towards rational thinking, which in terms of musical aesthetics favored a balance between form and expression, the Empfindzimmer Stil composers had no qualms about bending or modifying formal elements in order to suit the expressive content of a piece. In other words, expression was more important than form, so that the Empfindzimmer Stil arguably had more of an irrational rather than rational basis. If this sounds a bit like 19th century romanticism, it's because in many respects the Empfindzimmer Stil was a proto-romantic style and in this case musical developments parallel similar developments in mid-18th century literature. A notable literary example would be Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, published in 1764, which is considered the first Gothic novel and which would initiate a genre that includes such notable 19th century examples as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The Empfindzimmer Stil arguably provides the missing link between the late 18th century classical style and the beginnings of Romanticism in early 19th century works by composers such as Beethoven. And while Wilhelm Friedemann Bach never achieved particular fame, the main source of influence would have come from another of Bach's children, namely Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. Carl Philipp Emanuel was one of the main exponents of the Empfindzimmer Stil, and while nowadays his musical contributions are overshadowed by those of his father, it is important to keep in mind that during the 18th century, the situation was exactly the opposite, with Carl Philipp Emanuel being both better known and more influential than his father. I've already mentioned Mozart's admiration for Carl Philipp Emanuel, and it is important to note that Beethoven not only regarded him very highly as well, but also would have been intimately familiar with Carl Philipp Emanuel's music, even in his youth, especially since he was born in Germany. In many respects, Beethoven's style is a combination of the classical formal patterns of the Viennese school with the emphasis on expression exemplified by the Empfindzimmer Stil. Wilhelm Friedemann Bach's Polonaise in E minor is the eighth in a set of 12 Polonaise composed around 1765. These 12 Polonaise must have been some of his most popular works during his lifetime, as evidenced by the existence of several manuscript copies, although his attempts to publish them proved unsuccessful. Stylistically, they all belong to the Empfindzimmer Stil. The emphasis on expression is evident in the Polonaise in E minor, where dance elements almost disappear behind a sometimes dizzying succession of aria, recitative, and fantasia-like elements. Since Wilhelm Friedemann assigns specific musical gestures to each of these elements, let me demonstrate what each of them sounds like so you can identify them throughout the piece. So what I call the aria-like elements, the gesture that we can associate with that is a melody that consists of usually very extreme leaps and an accompaniment in the left hand. And this happens at the very, very beginning of the piece. So immediately we get this melody 
that starts with a leap of a tenth. So, this extreme leap. Let me say one thing about the performance of this leap. Um, I'm sure there are going to be some of you that can actually stretch a tenth and you can connect those two notes. My advice would be to actually not do that. I kind of like the idea of showing how to reach from one note to another has a certain degree of impossibility. Now you probably noticed that I'm using both hands to actually play this. This simply has to do with what I've explained in previous videos. I have this issue with my hands and they don't like stretches. Now obviously I don't have to stretch because I want to separate the two notes. However, my hand still doesn't completely like that. So yes, I'm using both hands, but I am simulating the effect as if I were playing with one hand. Now, the, what I call the fantasia-like section has this type of gesture associated with it. Let me start one measure before this happens, which is this. And now this is what I call the fantasia-like section. And we have several of those again throughout the piece. Now the recitative-like gestures, we first really encounter them in the second section of the piece that um, they kind of succeed. They come right after a fantasia-like section. So the first encounter is this one here. We start with a fantasia-like gesture. And here now, And then immediately again, another fantasia. And again, rest the teeth. Etc., etc. So that's what I mentioned before in the introduction that sometimes these gestures succeed one another quite fast, and uh, so these, these sections sometimes almost coexist uh, with one another. Um, now, one more thing I would like to mention is what I consider the expressive high point of the piece, and this happens in the second section right before we return to the material of the first section, since the entire piece is in rounded binary form. And what we have here is we have an intensification of this idea of a leap of a tenth. Because up to now, when we have this type of melody, usually it kind of proceeds a little more gradually. So now the same idea, just a step down and another step down. Uh, but what we're going to find in this one section right before the return of the material from the A section is an intensification because suddenly we have these leaps separated themselves by other leaps so that everything becomes very extreme and sometimes we have leaps that almost happen at the same time as other leaps. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Um, we're going to start with what is part of a fantasia-like gesture, this one here. And now notice what is going to happen. In other words, the right hand is doing this. And then we go higher and even more high. 
while at the same time the left hand is also having its own leaps. So all of this is happening pretty much at the same time. And then with a very short fantasia-like gesture, we will return to the material from the beginning of the piece. One final interpretive aspect I would like to mention has to do with the dynamic markings we find in the score. I'm sure you noticed in the video performance that I frequently switched between the two manuals or keyboards of the harpsichord and also that in certain places I was playing the left hand on the upper manual and the right hand on the lower manual. For the most part, these manual changes reflect the two exclusive dynamic markings contained in the score, piano and forte. Of course, at this point there is a, at least for the purposes of this video, secondary consideration which has to do with whether Wilhelm Friedemann had a particular instrument in mind. The manuscript copies I have been able to examine online do not mention a particular instrument. I happen to suspect that Wilhelm Friedemann may have had a particular instrument in mind, or at least probably conceived the polonaise on a particular instrument. But I think this opens up a quite complicated can of worms, so let's just say that given the date of composition, a performer has basically three choices clavichord, harpsichord, and fortepiano. Nowadays, the Empfindzimmerstil tends to be associated with the clavichord, especially because it seems to have been Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach's favorite keyboard instrument, and it did indeed enjoy a considerable degree of popularity during that time. However, I think the harpsichord is an equally valid candidate at least for this set of polonaise and the dynamic markings piano and forte that Wilhelm Friedemann Bach indicates are perfectly realizable on a two manual instrument. It's important to recall here that Johann Sebastian Bach included precisely such piano and forte markings in his harpsichord music in order to specify the use of different manuals. In my performance, I follow Wilhelm Friedemann's dynamic markings and play the passages marked forte on the lower manual and the passages marked piano on the upper manual. However, I have also decided to create a more audible differentiation between the melody and the accompaniment of the aria-like sections so during those sections, I play the right hand melody on the lower manual and the left hand accompaniment on the upper manual. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance.